Too, but Merry Christmas to all of you today. It is so good to have you with us on our Christmas Sunday here at New Hope. If you are a guest today, you honor us by your presence. Thank you so very, very much for coming. There are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to get one, fill it out, put it in the offering bag. We make promises to our guests every week. We will not come knock on your door. We will not pester you on the phone. But through the mail, we will send you information that tells you about New Hope, answers your questions about our staff, our ministries, the times of our services, and we would love to get that in your hands. That card is also for our regulars here. Uh, if you've got prayer requests or announcements or information to get to staff or you want to set an appointment, fill that out. We normally follow up those on Tuesday mornings. That probably will not happen this Tuesday morning, all right? Just kind of letting you know there's a big day coming up Tuesday, and uh, I don't think any of the staff's going to be around here, but we will attend to it before the week is over. So thank you all for, for doing that. We'd appreciate that. While I'm talking about staff, uh, we're going to be on minimum schedule for the rest of this week, all right? So uh, somebody will probably be in the office Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday till about noonish, all right? If it's after that, please don't hesitate to uh, call me on my cell phone or to call Mark on his, all right? Uh, we'll be responsive and we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly can, but regular hours are going to be sort of suspended during the week. Uh, let me take just a minute to highlight a couple of things on building. If you were guests with us, we're kind of keeping announcements to a bare minimum today. But uh, if any of you brought back your pledge cards for our new building project, you may put those either in the offering or drop them off in the red box that's back in the foyer. I can tell you where we are now. It's just a little over $900,000 as we are getting to our $1.5 million goal. All right? So thank you for the help. Now, obviously, I still have the beard. Uh, that comes off when we hit the million dollar mark, all right, at a, uh, this is really stupid, but at the church board, uh, church wide business meeting, uh, early in the month, uh, somebody, one of the board members threw a gauntlet down and said, what will it take to shave your head? This is an expensive piece of property, okay, I'm just telling you, this doesn't go cheaply. If we hit 1.2 million by the 31st of December, this will come off. All right? So you got a little over a week to get there. All right? So uh, if somebody really wants to see me ball that badly, all right? Now, uh, on the heels of that, uh, next Sunday, uh, this is going to be our last offering that we take for our church this year. All right? The offering next Sunday, which is the last Sunday of the year, uh, all of that is going to the building fund, all right? So whatever you bring next week, uh, Tim, I've already put mine in for the month. Hey, this is Christmas. Bring a little extra, all right? Or you didn't put yours in yet, uh, bring it next week. Um, I, I don't have answers to you yet. I've told you there may be some matching funds involved in next Sunday's offering, and as soon as I get that uh, information nailed down, I'll send out an email this week and let you know. But whether it's matching funds or not, it would be a great way to put a big boost in that. Uh, plans are working their way through the county and the city of Clovis, and so uh, we appear to be somewhat on schedule for a, a mid-year start and breaking ground on that. So uh, enough said about that. Uh, let me highlight a couple of other things. Uh, let me move to prayer requests. Um, if you got my email yesterday, my two emails yesterday, all right, hopefully you didn't panic with the first one, all right. Um, as I told you in that email that you finally got, I had spent about 30 minutes typing that email, wanted to word things just a particular way, and when I put the, uh, hit the word send, it, it, it got sent to email hell, okay? Uh, I have no idea where it went. It was gone. My screen went blank. It was gone. Uh, I have to acknowledge to you, I grew a little frustrated, annoyed, and aggravated, and I, may not, I might have even spoke a little curtly to my wife at that moment. Did I? Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you for that public confirmation, all right? <laughs> and then I had to pause and reflect on what I had just written a little bit, okay, and let the uh, validity of that take over. But in that process, I, uh, I made a typo. I said that the two Christmas Eve services were at 5 and 9. That is not correct. They are at 4 and 9. I sent an email within about 10 minutes correcting that. Uh, but some didn't read that far, so I'm clarifying it today. They are at 4 and 9. Those two services, if you've never been to a Christmas Eve service, uh, Mark leads the 4 o'clock, I lead the 9 o'clock, 
and uh, they are a casual, comfortable way for us just to remember what these days are all about. Uh, we get to sing uh, Christmas carols, we get to share a little bit about our faith, we get to be encouraged about what this season means, uh, and it's a come-as-you-are event at both of them. If you're dressed to go out to a nice dinner at 4 o'clock, man, come dressed to the nines. Uh, if you already are uh, casual and ready for bed at 9 o'clock, you've got your PJs on, then you can come in those, because the requirement with PJs, you must wear a robe. <laughs> it must be a relatively thick robe. Do you get my drift? Okay, no Victoria's Secret robes, all right, allowed that night, all right? These need to be warm, fuzzy, big robes, all right? So uh, just a little caution there. So uh, those are the announcements that we wanted to uh, take care of there. Uh, a few prayer requests. One I was just handed this morning from uh, Margaret Ariza, who's in, our, in this service. She's requesting prayer for her niece, uh, Priscilla Melendez. She was in a house fire and an explosion. She is in the Fresno Community Burn Hospital. She is in intensive care with second and third degree burns. And she would like us to remember to pray for Priscilla and Cecil's gonna get there right away and visit with her. Uh, Shelley also just received a text this morning and uh, Danny Clemenson, he and his wife have been part of our church for several years. He is in the hospital today getting stents in his heart. And so we want to uh, want to remember uh, Danny as he goes through that process today. Um, Nancy had surgery this past week and uh, she is home and doing very well, but it will be an extensive, that's Nancy Krause, a very extensive recovery for her. So please remember Nancy as she goes through this process. Dane Wildy will be going up to Redwood City to a heart specialty center and he's going to be having a very serious heart surgery this week uh, on the 27th. And so uh, I want you to be praying for Dane as he go up for, uh, for that heart procedure. Uh, last November, a year ago, last November, I had the opportunity to baptize Bobby Dale Crossley in his bathtub in his home. I told him he is the only guy that has the distinction of being baptized in his bathtub for me, except when I'm in Africa. In Africa, I've baptized a lot of people in the bathtub outdoors, but this is the first indoor bathtub baptism I'd ever done. Uh, Bobby has been under serious health watch for about the last six years and he is now under hospice care and uh, could be going home to be with Jesus anytime soon. Uh, those who've already done that just this past week, uh, Woody Imke at the beginning of the week, part of our church for several years, uh, went home to be with Jesus. And so I want you to be praying for his wife, Virginia. I don't have information on services yet. Uh, Carl Hinky, Carl works uh, here at the church for us. His mom lives in Edmond, Oklahoma. He got a call that she uh, might not make it to Christmas. So he and his wife, who was going to be in the choir this morning, got in the car on Wednesday, headed for Oklahoma. He got there in time to wish his mother a Merry Christmas and spend a little over a day with her. And Saturday, she went home to be with Jesus. And then yesterday, or Friday at about uh, 11 o'clock, uh, Dad happened to be at the office seeing if we were working and uh, got a call from Bobette Hicks that she had had a call from hospice saying that uh, it could be any time for Frank. Dad and I jumped in the car and headed over there. As we walked into Frank's room, uh, the hospice nurse was uh, pronouncing him heaven bound at that very moment. Frank Hicks was a longtime member of our church. For many, many years, he served on our elder board. Uh, one of the sweetest men that you would ever meet, and that might be the reason that he sold candy for a living. Uh, he was just a very, very sweet gentleman and very helpful around the church. It was Frank Hicks, George Manon, uh, Gene Fry, and my dad that were the Mr. Fix-It guys around here for about 12 years. And three of the four are in heaven right now, and the fourth one can't figure out why he's not, all right? <laughs> That'd be my dad, all right? But uh, God still hasn't finished with him yet. And so if you would just remember each of these, I know that uh, their families would be grateful. Do we need a little bit of cool air in here? Yeah. All right, we're gonna, we had the heater on last service, we turned them off. I think we need just a dab of cool air in here. How about a choir? Yes, yes all right. All right. I'm going to ask our ushers to come wait on us this morning as we have our morning tithes and offering. Folks, if you would come, and would you join with me as we pray? It's going to be a good offering today. The ladies are taking care of us, all right? They always do a good job. Would you join with me as we pray? Father, I love you so much. I'm grateful for the season grateful for what it means to us, and I'm grateful for what it can mean to others. And I trust today, 
that, Father, as a result of our time together, as we celebrate with the music, as, uh, as we enjoy what you have to say to us out of the scriptures, that we will walk out of here today with a greater sense of meaning for the season than we ever have before. Father, there are some who've carried some hurts into this service, hurts because of what have happened to loved ones, hurts because of things that have happened to them, hurts because circumstances just have, uh, have gone against them in recent days. And Father, today I hope they leave with more hope than they do hurt. There are some today, Father, who are here and their hearts are heavy because there's an absence in their family, in their circle of close friends. It's an absence that uh, will never be reconnected in this world. But Father, most of them I know about had faith in you and so we know that this absence is temporary. They'll never come be with us again, but we have great joy in knowing that we will go be with them. So if they're there, those who have come here today with grief and sorrow, I trust that they will leave here today with a great sense of comfort and a big dose of peace, the kind of peace that your scripture says passes all human understanding. When the dictates of our world say we should be stressed, promises of your scripture says we'll have peace so father thank you for this incredible gift and in the person of your son the lord jesus who is the difference maker in our life in our communities in our country and in the world thank you for the way in which you've met the needs of new hope and father i trust as you meet our needs that we follow your leadership and direction in meeting the needs of others i hope that uh, we don't seek our needs being met for selfish purpose. But Father, I trust that we enjoy the benefits of you meeting our needs with the express purpose of taking how you have cared for us and then we in turn care for those around us. We love you. We want you to be magnified in our presence today. We pray for strength and vitality in our choir and their voices, for um, concentration of thought with our band as they lift up their praise to their various gifts to you this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Once the offering baskets have passed, we invite you to stand and worship with us. And I got to tell you, I, uh, I have never seen a drummer who can sing while he plays. And he only sings with his face, all right? He doesn't ever say a word, but his face just worships the Lord. Thanks, Nate. Great job, buddy, and you didn't break the drums this year. It's really, really good. All right. <laughs> One more service to go. All right. Wow. You know, the way that song started, you guys probably thought Shaft was about ready to come out on the stage just now, but um, unfortunately, you're stuck with me. All right. I invite you, if you would love to uh, follow me in the scriptures in a few minutes, uh, we'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew today. Uh, and it's chapter 2 in both of those Gospels. So if you want to get prepared, you certainly are welcome to do so. Before I jump in the message, many of you have asked today as uh, we were making our rounds greeting folks, uh, how's uh, donut sales going? I will be so glad when Christmas Day is over. Uh, some of you are saying, why are you talking about donut sales on Christmas morning? Well, for some of you who may be new or visiting with us, uh, Shelly and I, uh, September a year ago, moved into what's now known as uh, Candy Cane Lane or Cindy Lane, the Christmas light area. And so launching a building project, we thought, what's a way we could give a little boost to the building fund? And Shelly had this wonderful idea from a wedding we did on the coast that why don't we sell mini donuts out on our front driveway? And that sounded really, really good back in August, all right? <laughs> uh, we didn't think through this whole idea of five hours a night for 30 consecutive days, but uh, it's been fun. It has been a lot of fun. We've met some wonderful people. Uh, we've had some great experience, some wonderful lessons being taught to us, and uh, so many wonderful volunteers from our church who have come and who have assisted us uh, in the process. And so how's it going? It's been going very, very well. Uh, Saturday night a week ago has been our biggest night. 290 dozen donuts sold that night. Last night was about 235 dozen. Uh, and had we stayed open until 1030, we probably could have gotten to 300 dozen. But uh, somebody had to preach today. And uh, so we wrapped up around, uh, around 930 last night. 
Um, we will be out there this evening. The guaranteed, this, this guaranteed will be out there tonight. All right? So if you haven't been by for donuts or just to see the lights, come on by and, uh, and, and stop in. Um, Christmas Eve is still a little up in the air. Last week it showed rain. That rain has sort of gone away. Uh, we don't have volunteers except for family. We do Christmas Eve at, at, at our house. Uh, our, the Roland family usually celebrates on Christmas Eve. And uh, then we have a Christmas service at 9, so I sort of have to bail on them. <laughs> I bailed the first week, and I'm bailing Christmas Eve. Uh, <laughs> don't bring that up around Shelly right now, all right? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I don't know if there's anybody who would like to help out, uh, maybe from around 7.30 to 9.30 tomorrow night, if that's something that you could do. Let Shelly or myself know, and we'll see how that would work out. And uh, Christmas night still up in the air. Uh, Christmas Day is kind of low-key for us, so we'll probably be out there. It might be a shortened night, but uh, come the 25th, we're, we're done. Um, <laughs> till next year, we've got plans uh, how to do this slightly different for next year. Uh, but it, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it looks like uh, where we are right now, uh, we'll probably be able to donate from the donuts. Uh, between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars to the building fund. All right, so uh, that's been really, really uh, exciting. It was uh, early in the week, and I'm not sure who the volunteers were that night. Uh, but uh, we try not to keep uh, a lot of cash in the cash box outside, and we try not to keep it in our house very long. So, if any of you here today are guests and you're thinking about robbing our house because of the <laughs> Donut cash cow. We don't keep it long, all right? Um, but I was, I was taking uh, some 20s in and, you know, hiding them in the, uh, the safe, uh, which basically is um, our silverware drawer underneath the... Uh, <laughs> but it might not be that easy. We have two silverware drawers, okay? So it might not be that easy. Might change it up tonight. But anyway... Uh, as I was doing that in and I'm carrying this cash in and I'm going by the guys cooking in the garage, uh, I had this crazy uh, thought occur to me is now I know what drug dealers feel like. <laughs> I'm cooking in the garage. <laughs> it's a cash only business and I'm selling nickel bags. All right. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, I don't know what that means for a pastor, but it's kind of it's weird, I got to tell you. So anyway, en enough about that, and let's uh, engage for the reason for this season. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is um, a name, unfortunately, that is, has uh, headed to obscurity. There's not a lot of folks who still remember the name or even recognize it when I mention it. And what's sad about that is it's not that long ago. The story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, ended in World War II at the very end. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a um, German pastor, theologian. He was one who thought his faith should impact his life and his culture. And when Hitler was rising to power and the Nazi, re Nazi regime was taking over, Bonhoeffer was not silent. He spoke out. As a result of his bravery and courage it resulted in his arrest his imprisonment and then listen to this his execution just hours before the allies liberated the concentration camp he had been held in if you want to read a book that will challenge the depth of your discipleship and the quality of the walk of a life you have with Jesus Christ I would encourage you to read The Cost of Discipleship that Bonhoeffer wrote in prison. It's not as difficult to read as C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity in understanding what he's saying, but the challenge and the conviction of which he writes about the cost of discipleship is even more powerful. While incarcerated, he wrote a series of meditations about Christmas. And in one of those meditations, I found this sentence. Listen carefully. It is not a light thing to God that we celebrate Christmas and do not take it seriously. Let me say that again. 
it is not a light thing to God that we celebrate Christmas and do not take it seriously. The theme for this Christmas season, since the Sunday after Christmas is indicated in the decorations of our stage, is an unopened gift. Folks who've never taken the time to unopen the gift of Christmas in their life have not taken Christmas seriously. And those who have opened the gift and have grown apathetic about the value of that gift do not take the celebration of Christmas serious enough. We've spent a little time over the last few weeks at looking how lavish this gift is. We've looked at how loving this gift is. We have looked at how lasting this gift is. And there's one singular verse that describes all three of those better than any other verse in the Bible. It is the most well-known memory verse there is. For God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten son. That's how lavish it is, all right? That whosoever believeth on him would not perish. Here's how long it is but have everlasting life. It is a lavish, loving, and eternal gift. What we must also remember, and we spent a brief time talking about this over the last few weeks, it is a gift that is limited in its time offer. There's an expiration date on opening the gift. It ends at your death you don't get to open the gift once you've walked through the portals of death if you haven't opened it before you don't get the benefits afterwards if you open the gift before a thief on a cross opened it minutes before he died I do not recommend you postpone to that moment but up until your death the offer is good and valid after your death that is not. You see, if you open the gift, you have everlasting life in heaven. If you never open the gift, you have hell and eternal frustration and pain. Somehow it doesn't seem to be a difficult choice, and yet it's so hard to make. I see some of you fanning. I see some of you sort of shivering. Is it too cold? No? Okay, perfect. We're good. So a few questions. As a child, for some of you, you're going to have to reach way back in time to think about that. For others of you, it won't be all that long ago. But as a child, do you remember sitting on your living room couch and looking at the Christmas tree and wondering which one of those gifts were yours? Remember doing that? Oh, I did. Do you ever remember sitting on the floor once you figured out which gifts were yours and you would sit next to your present and you would try to imagine what was in it? Did you ever try to sneak a peek at a gift that you knew was yours? I mean, lift the edge of the paper just a little bit to see if you could figure it out? Or did you even have the audacity of going so far as when your parents weren't home Sneaking that gift out from under the tree, trying to remember exact. You know, when I was a kid, cell phones would have been really helpful <laughs> because we could have taken the picture of how it was exactly situated under the tree. We had to memorize it in our brain back then, all right? And then we would try to open it up, unwrap it so that the tape wouldn't tear the paper. And you know what? Tape was nasty when I was a kid. I mean, today it's pretty easy, all right? You can, but when I was a kid, man, it stuck, all right? And it was tough to get it off without messing up the paper and just really unwrapping it. I, I had friends who actually played with their Christmas presents and put them back before our Christmas morning. I, I didn't quite go to that far, but I was close a few times. And let's be honest for a moment. Was there ever an occasion that you wanted to be the first one to open a present on Christmas you just really couldn't wait. I don't know what system you use. Every family tradition is different. 
the Roland family tradition is, is when we sit down to open our presents, somebody plays Santa Claus, and we pass out all the presents, and we put them around everybody's feet, and then we start with the youngest, and they open one, and we work around to the oldest, and then we go in reverse order, and we do that until we run out of gifts, all right? And I don't know what order you do, but man, sometimes, some Christmases, some package is just the right shape and size. You just can't hardly wait and you want to be the first one. I don't know about you, but I think all that's normal. It's the way I was as a kid. And I really do like to be normal. I don't pull it off very often, but I like to be. Here's what's not normal. What's not normal is showing no interest in the present under the tree. What's not normal is not wondering what's underneath the wrapping. What's not normal is not wanting to discover what's inside. It was 1903, it was December, and after many attempts, Orville and Wilbur Wright were successful in getting their flying machine, the airplane, off the ground. They were ecstatic and they telegraphed their message to their sister Catherine, we have actually flown 120 feet! We will be home for Christmas. Catherine hurried to the editor of the local newspaper, so proud of her brothers. She showed him the message. He glanced at it and said, oh, how nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. He totally missed the message that they had flown. We sing a song about being home for Christmas. My son called yesterday, just he's in Oklahoma, as you know, supposed to start a job Monday morning. Some things haven't worked quite right. He might not get to start Monday morning. He could have come home for Christmas, but he's not going to be. By the way, I haven't told any of my family yet. I may have one of the best Christmas presents of the year. Um, I got a message from Bob Thomas, who's a preacher in Oklahoma. He's kind of helping look after my son that's just moved there, and they he's engaged in helping a church restart in the town of Ardmore. He said, I got to tell you, your son is a gift to that church. He said, I couldn't be there. He lives an hour and a half away. He said, we had some serious situations of people in the hospital. Your son did hospital visitation yesterday and brought great comfort to families there. That's a gift a pastor father just can't pass up. But how many times do we get home for Christmas and we miss the big news? Jesus lives. What prompts people in our culture not to be normal anymore at Christmas time? I'll suggest to you a variety of reasons. Number one, our age. And I'm not talking about being old. I'm talking about getting older. Thinking that we are too mature to enjoy the gift of Christmas, we lose our sense of wonder and childlikeness. I will suggest to you that whatever age you are, if you have lost your wonder and childlikeness, you are old. That's the definition of old. Not chronological numbers, but an attitude of heart and mind and soul that loses its wonder and its joy. How about busyness causes us to not be normal? Thinking I don't have time to explore and wonder mysteries anymore because I'm so busy with life. How about circumstances that have got you tired, like selling donuts, <laughs> or sick of the smell of donuts, <laughs> or just sick and tired of donuts or anything else? Always unhappy, thinking life doesn't treat you fairly. How about an attitude of selfishness? Why is my present not bigger than my brother's? Why does my sister have more presents than I do? How about the conditions of our world? It's not the government I want. It's not the taxes I, I desire to pay. What about the conditions of my religion? Uh, I've substituted genuine faith for religious activity. I've abandoned religion because I've been hurt by the church in the past. I wasn't treated the way I thought I should be treated. doesn't matter how I treated them. I'm, I'm very religious, I'm very active, but I'm also very apathetic. What's the condition of your faith? Let's read the Christmas story and see if we can discover what life was like then 
what was normal, what was abnormal, and maybe draw some conclusions for ourselves today. Let's jump in. If we're going to read a story about a birth, we should always start with the doctor. So let's read from Luke first, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. That should be a red flag to you already. We're talking about the birth of a Jewish boy, and yet the government is Rome. Israel is no longer self-governing monarchy. They are under the thumb of a foreign government. This was the first census that was to be taken by that guy's name is who too hard for anybody to pronounce, and he had become governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. Bethlehem, small town, small community. We might equate it to Malaga. Small place, not very big, not well known. And yet it was the place of kings where David was from, the greatest king that Israel had ever known. It's also the community where the last king of Israel was born, Jesus. And Joseph went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child, miraculous birth. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, she didn't have to wonder whether they should have blue or pink swaddling clothes. She knew, you, you know, we have, they, you guys have parties now, what's it called, gender reveal? Is that right? Yeah, we, they didn't, they, the, the gender was revealed at the very beginning of this pregnancy, all right? They, they knew they were having a boy. So she wrapped him, she wrapped him. What do you do with a Christmas gift? You, you wrap him. You placed him in a manger because there was a guy who ran an inn that didn't have time to open a gift. He shoved him in a barn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Shepherds, the lowest level of employment of the day, of the culture. And the shepherds were living out in the fields nearby and they were keeping watch over their flocks at night. They were doing exactly what they did every night. And in the midst of the monotony of their career, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were terrified. Every time I read of an angelic appearance in the Bible, they must scare the living bejabbers out of people, because every time it says they're terrified. But the angel said to them, the same thing he says to everybody when an angel shows up and the people are terrified, don't be afraid. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if God sent the message first, don't be afraid, an angel's coming? But he always sends the angel first. I think he gets a little kick out of that. All right. And then he says, no, hey, guys, this is nothing to be afraid about. I'm just busy right now. I'm going to take care of some things. I'm going to bring you good, no good news of great joy, and it will be for all people. Today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. He's the King of Kings. Here's a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host, they appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, on earth peace to men on whom favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, eh, Let's wait a couple of days and see if we hear any rumors about this thing. No. They said, Let's go to Bethlehem. Forget the sheep. Forget the job. Forget what we've been doing because something is more important is taking place right now. Let's go see if what has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby, the gift, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they went to Bible college and learned how to tell other people about this wonderful thing that had happened to them. No. Oh. They went immediately and told everybody they could find. Verse 18, and all who heard it were amazed. When's the last time you told somebody about the amazing things that Jesus has done in your life? It's a donut lesson. Earlier this week, there was a guy about 6'1", 6'2", walked with an attitude, had a San Francisco hat on, had some tats up his neck to, behind his ear, and had a teardrop right here. 
wanted a bag of donuts. Had his little kid in a stroller and his wife behind. Kind of the pitch. When they're ready to buy, I point to them and say, hey, see that picture up there? That's a building. We call it the barn. And what you're doing here is helping us buy that barn. This isn't to pay our electrical bill. This is to help our church build that barn. That guy's smile went from ear to ear. He said, this is for God. He said, let me tell you what Jesus did in my life. And he told me how he had been transformed from a thug to a child of God. And he said, my life has never been the same. He hadn't been to Bible college, but he could tell me about the amazing thing that God had done in his life. Shepherds did it. So should we. But Mary, she treasured up all these things, and she pondered them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorified, praising God for all the things. Guess what? They got back to the sheep, and the sheep were okay without them. The sheep did just fine. Jump over to Matthew with me. Chapter 2. And after Jesus was born of Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, the Roman, the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. These were Persian men. These were, not, these were not Jewish men. They were from another culture, another religious tradition. They were smart. They were well-educated. They were inquisitive. They knew more about the coming Messiah than the Pharisees and the high priests did for some reason. Doesn't make sense to me. And they came to Herod and said, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east. We've come to worship him. They thought Herod, who was the Roman emperor at the time, would be excited too. This great king of the world is coming. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed. He wasn't excited. He was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. And when he called together all the people, chief priests, teachers of the law, he asked them where this Christ was to be born. They said, in Bethlehem, Judea. And they replied, but this is what the prophet wrote. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you a ruler will come and will be the shepherd of the people of Israel. The problem is the people of Israel did not want to be shepherded by this Jesus. And then Herod called the Magi secretly. Hey, shh, come here. And he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem. And he said, go, make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. Liar. Pants on fire. Herod was like so many today. He was phony with his worship. He did not want what Jesus offered. He wanted to control the circumstances of his own life so he wouldn't lose his influence and power. After they had heard the king, they went on their own way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, you see, he wasn't still in the barn. This is a period of time. The shepherds got there that night. The wise men got there sometime later. We'll find out in just a moment as much as potentially two years later. Okay, so somewhere between one month and 24 months, they found the house and saw the child with his mother. And they bowed down and they worshiped him. And then they opened the treasures. They presented him with the gifts of gold, the gifts befitting a king, and incense, the gifts befitting a priest. And the gift of myrrh, the gift that you would be used at a time of death. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Verse 16, when Herod realized he had been outwitted by the Magi, well, why shouldn't he have realized he would be outwitted by them? They were wise men. He was not. He was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. And the prophecies of Jeremiah were fulfilled as recorded to us in verse 18. Herod did not want to worship Jesus. Herod wanted to extinguish Jesus from the face of the earth. So let me wrap. I've got to go very quickly here. What were the conditions of the world at the time that Jesus was born? Well, we discover that Israel was under the authority of the Roman Empire. They reigned with fear and terror and severe consequence, like the killing of young boys who were two years and younger with the hopes of wiping Jesus off the face of the earth. It was a time of heavy taxation. That is the reason that Mary and Joseph happened to be in Bethlehem. It's the equivalent of our April 15th. What was the condition of religion at that time? The Jewish, faith was a, was, the Jewish faith had become a form of religion, no longer matters of faith, but matters of law. 
They were governed by legalistic priests, Pharisees, and Sadducees who added burdensome laws above what God had required of them, much like Rome had added burdensome taxes. Jesus goes to the temple in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, as a 12-year-old boy. He goes to the temple. He teaches the priests. They were so thick-headed about their own power and position. They didn't recognize who Jesus was. He imparts the scripture to them. They marvel at what he says. And then he scolds them. He says, why don't you think I would be here? This is my father's house. This is the temple of the living God. Jesus grows up. Then he does his first miracle. He transforms water to wine. And then where does he go? He goes to the temple. And what does he do this time? He drives out the money changers and he says to them, what have you done to my father's house? This is to be a house of prayer. You have turned it into a den of thieves. Jesus didn't mess around with these guys. The very people who should have recognized and been delighted with his arrival turned deaf ears and blind eyes towards him. Isn't it ironic that it was shepherds in a field the lowest on the economic ladder you could find in that culture, and magi from the east, Persians, Persians who were the first interested parties in getting a sneak peek at the Christmas present under the tree. Men from another culture, different nationality, different religious tradition, and lowly shepherds. They sneaked a peek. No wonder, Jesus said to the rest of Israel later in his ministry, I've come to my own, but my own receive me not. He went unrecognized, he went underappreciated, and he was underestimated by most. And I'm not sure that a lot has changed in 2,000 years. What were the circumstances of Jesus' arrival that day? It was a unique arrival, a miraculous birth, fulfilling dozens if not hundreds of prophecies. It was a humble arrival. He came through a manger at a stable it was profoundly personal to Mary and Joseph. It was purposely inclusive, shepherds to wise men, disciples to Samaritan women. It was powerfully transforming for a priest by the name of Simeon, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, and a woman at the well. What are the conditions of our life today at the arrival of this gift under our tree? I suggest to you it's not much different than it was then. Government rarely pleases us, taxes are too high, and we fear what the next decision might mean to us. What's the condition of our faith? Have you substituted religion for faith, or possibly abandoned faith altogether because religion became too burdensome or irrelevant or boring? Are you busy doing religious things that you have no time to hear the voice of God? What could be the circumstances of Jesus' arrival in your life today if you would let him? I promise you it would be unique. As Nicodemus learned, we must be born again, and that's a miracle act. It will be humble because you have to be humble to receive the gift. Why? Because you have to admit that you were a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe that Jesus is that Savior and invite him in to be the Lord of your life, saying, I'm going to let you be in charge from now on. It should be profoundly personal. Nobody can do it for you. It's between you and Jesus. It's purposely inclusive. He's available to every one of you. There is no prejudice here from shepherds to Persian magi. And it is powerfully transforming. He took plain, ordinary fishermen and made them apostles. A murderer became a church planter. A woman with poor reputation became an evangelist. And a thief became a saint in the closing moments of his life. Unrecognized, underappreciated, and unestimated by most... Jesus might not be the gift you want, but I promise you this, he's exactly the gift that you need. You need to sneak a peek. As I wrote in that um, email yesterday, I do some of my best thinking when I'm asleep. I've learned over the years that the thoughts that come, that wake me up, are not because I have a brilliant mind, but it's because God finally has me still and quiet long enough so I can hear his voice in my heart and in my head. Bob Thomas, my buddy from Oklahoma, sings a song that's one of my favorites, and he sang it for me two weeks ago when I was in Oklahoma. He still speaks. It's hard for me to imagine that God chooses to speak to me. But God chooses to speak to every one of us if we will not turn deaf ears his direction. But here's the thought that occurred to me that night. 
Will I choose to drown in my hurts, frustrations, and grief? Or will I choose to allow my heart to be lifted above my circumstances by hope, through faith, because of love, and experience unexplainable joy? I don't know about you, but that choice doesn't seem that difficult. And yet we make it so hard. And I got to be honest, after I wrote it, God then put it to a test immediate in my life because when I hit send, that email went to hell. <laughs> and you want to know the saddest part about that story? I found out after I rewrote this, following my wife's directions to not write it in an email post first, but to do it in a document, cut and paste, so if I lost something, I would still have it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I discovered? Well, no, that was, that's, with, yeah, this, that's not a new discovery, all right? What I discovered is the reason I lost internet service is because where the plug-in is, it's in my desk, it's down near my feet, and apparently I had kicked the plug loose that controls the internet power, all right, to my computer. So it was all my fault anyway. But you see, when that happened, I was frustrated, I was annoyed, and I had a choice to make. In something small, we learn lessons that apply in the big moments of life. Will my hurts, frustrations, and grief drag me down? Or will the hope God offers through the faith that He provides because of the love that He demonstrated give me joy? I had a choice. And so do you. Let's not leave the Christmas tree tree this year with an unopened present. Don't let personal circumstance or worldly condition or previous hurts and disappointments steal this opportunity from you. Don't let age or busyness or selfishness steal the Christmas. Even if you are not ready to accept the gift today, at least leave here today curious. At least start taking a sneak peek at what this big gift is. Lift a corner of the paper and notice that this is a gift that is filled with love, overflowing with hope, abounding in joy, offering forgiveness. Let the gift of this present prompt you to seek for answers. The shepherds, though they weren't well-educated, had enough sense to go check it out. The wise men, though well-educated, could have been stuffy, but they went and checked it out. Would you be willing to do the same? Let's pray. If you've never invited Jesus Christ in your life, you've never opened the gift of Christmas, why don't you open it this year? A simple, humble prayer of faith right where you are. If you've become apathetic in your relationship with God and it's become more religious than faithful, then why don't you be renewed with the joy of the wonder of a child? You see, it's Jesus who said, until we become like little children, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's ask him to restore childlike wonder to our faith. Let's pray. Father, it's been a good morning. I want to thank you for the tone of the music. I want to thank you for the openness of hearts that I've sensed in the services so far. Father, there could be someone in this service who's here as a guest. They're here because somebody was singing in the choir. There's been invited by a relative uh, they weren't aware when they arrived that this was a divine appointment for them I pray they'll discover that they're at the crossroads right now at this very moment of their want and their need and you have a gift for them and it's called forgiveness and I pray in the quietness of their heart with deep humility they'll say Lord I've done life without you and that's been wrong I'm ready to do life with you so you can make it right. Nothing fancy, just honesty. And at that moment, Father, you transform them from sinner to saint. Father, for others that may be praying, thank you that you're willing to restore childlike wonder to our faith and our relationship with you. Thank you for the difference this day has made as some began to take sneak peeks at a gift that up till now has been unopened and for those who are looking at their gifts with a new set of eyes, allowing you to restore a wonder that has been gone. We love you. We want to adore you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
God bless you. Now hurry up and get out of here so the next crowd can come in. Lots of coffee over here, all right? Go on out and greet some folks.